Hey everybody, Nick here, and today I got a review for you of this big guy right here. This is the Seiko SLA-021 Marine Master 300. Very interesting watch. Well, I'm really glad I got a chance to get one at the table. And actually, I got to thank my buddies over at Lewis Jewelers in Ann Arbor, Michigan for, uh, well, that. Um, they loaned this guy my way to take a look at. Um, they, they were my AD for pretty much everything uh, back when I lived in Michigan. And actually, they're still my AD for pretty much everything. They do uh, Seiko, Omega, Breitling, a bunch of other stuff. They ship. They could be your AD for that matter. Um, but anyways, if you give my buddy DK a call over there, uh, he'll hook you up. Uh, tell him Nick Shabazz sent you. He'll hook you up with some promotional pricing on this guy and a bunch of other stuff. So uh, anyways, thank you very much for that. But as always, they know I'm going to talk about the good, the great, the bad, the ugly. Might call it a gem, might call it junk. Um, so I appreciate them sending this guy along. Next thing, let's do some size measurement here. This is a watch that feels substantially big, even though in practice it's not actually all that large. Uh, coming in here at 42.3 millimeters uh, on the, the, the side to side. Uh, Lug to lug, we're looking at 50 millimeters, which is actually more reasonable than you'd expect. And the thickness of this guy, depending on how you measure, you're coming in around 15.1, 15.2. It really depends on that. And then the overall, uh, the, the, the band width over here is a 20 millimeter band. So uh, there you go. Next thing, um, I one thing I do want to do with this guy is actually get a weight on it, um, uh, because this is a, a chunky boy right here. This is a heavy watch. It's a big watch, and so I'm gonna go ahead and see if I can get this guy onto this scale here. Yeah, perfect. Add in the price, the tag. This is coming in at seven point seven nine ounces with its bracelet fully adjusted. This is a big chunky watch, and so you know, do keep that in mind as you're thinking about this. Next thing, this is going to be a quick review. Um, as you can see, the tag is still on it. I'm trying to keep it factory fresh for the next guy here, but it does give me a chance to spend some time with it, to look at it, to throw it on the time graph, and to, to, to do all the regular things that I one would want to do for a watch, except wear it out and about and beat the crap out of it. So I uh, keep that in mind as you're looking at this. And then finally, the price on this guy is kind of the elephant in the room. We are looking at a retail price of 3100 bucks. That is uh, non-trivial. But we'll talk about how it's earned that and whether it's earned that as we go throughout the review. So uh, let's go ahead and jump into the good, the great, the bad, the ugly of this very interesting watch. The good side. To start with, one of the things I actually appreciate is the fact that although it is a big, chunky uh, uh, watch over here, it is actually, it wears reasonably well. Part of that is the lug-to-lug -lug distance, which is pretty reasonable. And actually, this ends up, although obviously the bracelet isn't adjusted to my wrist, um, if I put this guy on my wrist, which is not a gigantic wrist, by the way, the way. We're looking at a, uh, you know, 6.75 inch wrist. This guy is not completely out of line. Um, it's a big, certainly, and it's frankly a little bigger than I'd like to wear, but the size they've done it at is sort of wearable for a lot more people than, say, like the Rolex Deep Sea um, or, or that kind of thing. So I appreciate that very much. Next thing, this has a quick adjust buckle. This is the thing that I complain about very most often, frankly, with modern watches, but Seiko especially has been very lazy in their bracelet buckles. This is not. Um, what this has is a special quick adjust button where you have not only a tooled quick adjust here, giving you an extra link or so uh, worth of adjustment, which kind of makes up for the lack of a half link, but more importantly, check this out. If I lift this part up here, and then I push it all the way forward, I am able to pull out this section here. And when I pull out this little section here, it then locks into place, and I'm able to, well, it locks into place in that direction. I can always push it back in, but this allows you to adjust it to fit your wrist very precisely. You just pop this the rest of the way out, and then, see, that little lever is activating it, and you can pull it into exactly the thickness you want. This makes this very easy to adjust, and it makes it adjust, you know, instantly. Um, and that's something I appreciate without tools or anything. So when your wrist swells up, or frankly, if you put on your dive suit, uh, you are uh, able to adjust happily. So that's a great thing, and it's something I very much appreciate seeing from Seiko, and I should be seeing on every single Seiko now. Thank you very much. It's 2020, get with the program. Next thing, this is a anti-reflective uh, anti -reflective coating uh, sapphire crystal on there. That's a great thing. You can see not a whole lot of reflectivity. And actually, I gotta be honest with you, the crystal on this is nice in that you have a great deal of viewing angle. Even though this is a very thick watch, for whatever reason, I, the, 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 the crystal provides a very nice set of perspectives such that it has viewing angles pretty widely. Um, and maybe more so than you'd expect. It's very hard to kind of get that across, but it does feel unusual in that way. Not sure how to describe it, but it's a thing. So that's good. Next thing, the bezel on this guy is great. It is a unidirectional dive bezel here, but it has just excellent feeling. It's very precise. It moved, but there's almost no play uh, to it back and forth. I mean, once it's locked in, but it still, it just 
Oh, and it feels good. This is a nice die bezel. Um, I, I'm a bit of a bevel, uh, bezel snob, and, you know, this one works out well, so that's good. Next thing, um, I gotta say, there were some very nice details on this guy. Um, specifically, if we take a look at the hands of this guy, let me see if I can zoom in a little bit and show you this better. Try and get the reflections out of the way, but if we look at the very sides of the hands here, there we go. See the sides of those hands? How they themselves have a polished bevel on them? Oh, yeah, look at that. That's kind of a nice thing. So these aren't just flat hands. These are hands with a special polish along the sides of them. This is the Zaratsu polish finishing. Um, it just, it looks beautiful. And you know what? It adds a little bit of something to that. Also, you'll notice that the hand on this is a gold color, as is the uh, the, the 300 meter in there. So uh, it's kind of a nice little nod to the uh, past of the... the, 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 the uh, line that is and it's just got a, it's got a, a bunch of nice little details and even the back of it is actually very attractive looking we'll talk a little bit more about the um uh, how this back works later on and why it's kind of unique here i'll polish this up a little bit so you can see that beautiful polish Oh, yeah, look at that. That's That's got some polishing right there. Big fan of that. So, um, this is the, uh, the, the, the that's kind of cool. It's got some nice details there. And the polishing in general on the case is, is just quite nice. Um, they've done a very excellent job here. Uh, no complaints there. Next thing, um, this guy has very nice loom. Charge this up before the review. Yeah, it's still going. Um, and in fact, I'll, I'll recharge it real quick just to make it extra obvious for people using a powerful flashlight. But yeah, this has serious loom, but interestingly, it has some of the numbers loom. You have loom on the 10 and the 20, as well as those two marks, but you don't have it on the 30, 40, 50. We'll talk about that later on, but the loom here is very powerful. It works very well. No complaints about that. Uh, Seiko does very good loom. Next thing, um, and actually the last thing on the good side, is that this guy has a um, caliber 8L35 movement. So the 8L35 isn't a movement that a lot of folks are familiar with, but a lot of folks are familiar with the 9S85, which is one of the Grand Seiko high beat movements. Turns out this is the same thing. Um, the only difference between the 8L35 and the 9S85 is the finishing quality. Basically, ha have they gone through and done all the fancy polishing on the movement itself? In practice, these are the same movement. Um, the other thing is regulation. This is an unregulated movement from the factory. We will get back to that one later on. But nonetheless, um, the 8L35 is a very nice movement, and it's actually a relatively fast movement. Um, it is a high beat style movement. So you can see here the second hand is moving very, very smoothly. It's moving 10 times per second, uh, which is actually a little bit above and beyond some of the movements you'll see in other uh, high-end watches. This is the Omega uh, Seamaster uh, 300 here. Nice little point of comparison. Uh, this guy is moving more smoothly. It's moving more often than the Omega is here. That's, that's something. And if we compare this to, uh, for instance, the Seiko Samurai, which is another big, chunky uh, Seiko diver, we can see here that the, uh, the, the, the second-hand movements are... Uh, very, very different. This guy moves much more, well, not much more quickly, because obviously it moves once a second. Well, moves a certain amount of time in a second. That's dumb. Anyways, moving on, this guy is just a lot more smooth than the Samurai. There we go. That's what I wanted to say there. So um, it is a 3,600 um, vibration per hour movement. It is a high beat movement, even though it's not advertised as such. 10 beats per second. It also has a 55 hour power reserve, which is a beautiful thing. It is a hacking movement, which means when I pull the crown all the way out, the second hand stops, as any good modern watch should be. It hand winds. So if I twist this when the crown is in the proper position, of course, the, uh, the, the it will wind it. And it's, in fact, a very smooth wind. Honestly, it's a great movement. Uh, there's a lot to love about this movement. It's great in the Grand Seiko, and it's great in this non-Grand Seiko, right? So that is an absolutely solid movement, by the way. Screw down crown, as you would expect on a diver. But uh, so that is, to me, all of the good here is it's an 8L35 movement, which is basically a Grand Seiko movement, just without some of the pretends. Um, it's got a, a, a nice crystal, solid loom, good details on the hands, beautiful polishing overall, anti-reflective sapphire. Um, it is a quick adjust buckle, Finally, uh, and it has a very short lug-to-lug -lug distance relative to a lot of your other big chunky divers. On the great side to me, this is kind of a weird thing, but uh, it, it, and in fact, I didn't even notice it at first. Um, but then I was sitting there, you know, holding the watch, taking a look at it, and myself, something's weird about this. Like, what's what's up with this watch back? This is a weird case back. And so I was sitting there, you know, holding it, like, okay, something's unusual here. And then it real I realized. Where do you open the case back? Seriously, there are no screws. In fact, there's not even a seam. 
And then eventually I realized this is a monoblock construction watch. What I mean by that is that the entire case is a single continuous chunk of steel that has been milled out uh, to accept the, the, for the movements. The only holes are right here and then where the crystal goes. And in fact, what this means is that in order to service this watch, you, you take out the crystal and everything happens through there. So as a result, there is no area for water to get into this because it is solid freaking steel. And by the way, take this, uh, check this out. Drilled lugs. That's a beautiful thing. If you haven't had drilled lugs, it just makes bracelet swatch, uh, switches so much easier. Um, but they're not, of course, going into the movement itself. The rest of it is completely a monoblock thing. Is this a super useful thing? Probably not. I mean, you can get this kind of water resistance, which, by the way, is 300 meters, which is so much water that uh, it's basically, if you go deeper than that, you're dead anyway, so it doesn't really matter what uh, whether your watch is okay. But nonetheless, it's got a lot of water resistance there, and that case back is very unusual, but it also means there's one fewer part to fail, right? You can't accidentally leave one of the screws loose if there's no screws. So I like that construction, and honestly, it's just, it's unusual. It's interesting, it's different, and it's kind of neat. So the monoblock construction is going to be, uh, to, to me at least, that's what's going to be great, because I think it's one of the things that distinguishes this from everything else. By the way, another detail prospects logo on the crown nice so to me that's what's great is that interesting construction on the bad side this is a thick watch um like i said this comes in the the, the nominal measurement is 15.4 uh, millimeters yeah, it's 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 pretty damn thick. I mean, it's also pretty heavy as well on the wrist. I I weighed it out earlier, and yeah, this is this is a big one. You really have got the love a big chunky watch on this guy. Um, in order for this to go on the wrist, well, you, you just gotta love that that thickness. You gotta be down with the thickness, and that's that, that a lot of folks are, but I, I I'm not. So do keep that in mind. Next thing, I do found it very very weird that not all of the numbers are loomed. Why on earth, Seiko? Given that there is no like functional difference, and given that some of them are. Why not just loom the rest of them? This seems so very, very weird. And honestly, it seems a little like a cut corner. Just loom the whole damn thing. What's wrong? Why? Why? Why, Seiko? Why generally? Just why? That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So I, I kind of feel like... Why? Um, next thing, the uh, clasp on this guy. I was just given a praise, and in fact, it does deserve praise. It's a nice, uh, quick adjust clasp. Maybe uh, because this part here is just stamped metal, it doesn't have the same luxury feel as some of your other, uh, uh come here, Romega. Mind you, this is a watch that's, uh, you know, two grand more, but this has a little bit more of a luxurious feeling to it than the stamped metal. But at the same time, you know, it works. It's a perfectly functional quick adjust clasp. The biggest problem with it, though, is it is very long. The clasp itself here, just the part of this guy that sits flat against the wrist, is itself 49 millimeters. So this means that if you have a relatively thin wrist, if your wrists are relatively not that big around, um, this is going to make the comfort of the watch very specific. Um, I say specific because I don't know whether it's bad or good. It's really going to depend on how you can get this guy adjusted. Um, and because the links are relatively long, you don't have all that many places of adjustment, although you can adjust using these manual adjust holes, this is going to be something that's going Going to be a little controversial. Um, having a long thing is controversial, meaning some wrists are going to love it, some wrists are going to hate it. Do keep that in mind. Next thing, the bracelet itself is honestly a little bit lazy for this kind of a price point. The reason I say that is, look at this. These are pinned links. Um, it is the case that a very, very large majority of, uh, of watch brands are now using screw-down links. We have a little Phillips or a little flathead driver in there. Makes it so much easier and more reliable to uh, swap the links in and out. It's just, it's better in every meaningful way. And I don't know why they're not doing this at three grand. Similarly, there's no half link. I mean, guys, come on. I Honestly, it really feels like the bracelet division at Seiko is just really phoning it in. It's just like one guy who says, uh, 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 here, I'll use this bracelet we've already got around. There's no innovation happening there. It's like, this is the area where Seiko is, lags behind most. This part is always great. This part, a little less so. Um, and then finally, on the bad side, the price on this guy is way up there. 3100 bucks retail. And again, that's retail. Working with a good AD, you should come in under retail. Um, seriously, don't pay the retail for this, but nonetheless, it, it, that's pretty high. I mean, to be fair, it's a Grand Seiko movement, and the construction is unique, but this is really a price at which everything needs to be dialed in perfectly. If you are buying a Seiko watch for three grand, everything needs to be done perfectly, and it's not quite there yet. They're pretty close, but they've got some things to work on, and we'll talk about that in just a second. 
So to me, that's the bad, is that 3100 bucks is a high price. The bracelet feels a little lazy at 3000 bucks. The clasp and the links are very, very long. Um, you've got all, not all your numbers on this guy are loomed for some reason. It's pretty heavy and it's pretty thick, but again, that could be a selling point for some. On the ugly front, they are not even trying to regulate this watch. This guy comes from the factory. This $3,000 watch has factory specification of plus 15 to minus 10 seconds per day. That means that it is perfectly okay with them if you get a watch that is running 10 seconds a day slow. You know what you call a watch that's 10 seconds a day slow? A busted watch. Uh, seriously, Seiko, you can do better than that. And the funny thing is that this same movement is rated plus three, my, or I'm sorry, minus three plus five in the Grand Seiko. When you put this one in there and when they take the time to regulate it, it can get with, to it a really, really good spec, but they just don't do it. The movement is capable of it, and they just haven't tried. And you can, of course, have a watchmaker do this yourself. You can send it to a watchmaker, and they will regulate it to within an inch of its life. But the thing is, no. That's why we're paying you, Seiko. Is $3,000 not enough for you to try and make the watch run right? No, come on, Seiko. This is insulting. So at this point in time, um, considering how many brands are doing this, it, you know, for a grand, you're getting something that's cost spec. I don't... No, I'm sorry. They need to be doing better than that. So to me, that is absolutely ugly. Uh, for three grand, not, not only should it be running super accurately, but you should be guaranteeing it running super accurately. In practice, looking at this on the time graph, I suspect it's going to run pretty accurately, but guarantee it, damn it. At three grand, you need to. So to me, that's what's ugly, is that they're not regulating the watch, even though it's three grand. On the final conclusion front, look, at some level, I think this is a really nice watch, right? Because it's you're looking for a big beefy diver. This is a solid, no pun intended. Actually, pun intended. Choice. Uh, because you're getting a, a nice buckle on it, a good crystal, good polishing, nice details, a great loom, great water resistance, a really good movement, and a pretty unique set of. You know, it's it's uniquely built. There aren't that many watches that are built like this, especially as you get towards the higher end. And this is all for a price that's lower than equivalent beefy Swiss pieces. At some level, uh, Seiko does still deliver a lower price than many. That said, um, you're still getting a big chunky watch, so you gotta love that. The loom situation's a little weird with that thing. The bracelet is still a little bit Seiko, and that's not a compliment. The price is definitely up there, and worst of all, they're not even willing to regulate it at the factory. Come on. Honestly, the hardest part for me is that they do feel like they've cut corners here, leaving some of the numbers on loom, the pinned links, no half links, and the lack of regulation. It's like, guys... Is a three grand Seiko. And not a three grand grand Seiko, but a three grand Seiko. Guys, come on. You can do better than that. Seriously. Um, this is a, a price at which they have to do their absolute best, but I think there are parts of Seiko's leadership that are still thinking like they're making a $300 watch when they've added a very important zero to the end of this guy. So as they raise the prices for mainline uh, Seiko, I think they need to raise their standards higher and higher. As the price goes up, their standards need to go up. Their bracelets need to go up. Their regulation needs to go up. They need to do a little bit better because right now, you know, yeah, if they were selling this guy for 300 bucks, I would wouldn't be complaining that much. But at three grand, yeah, I'm going to complain. So that's that's a frustration to me. And I really hope that some lead, you know, that Seiko, you know, moves with the times. In fact, there are some steps forward. We're seeing, you know, improvements in some of their more recent lines, like the new Alpinus have definitely stepped it up a notch. But I'm hoping that we see improvements here as well, specifically in that accuracy game. Because like I said, it's fine and accurate, but come on, that's your job, Seiko. Guaranteed. Um, but that said, all of that aside, and some of those are kind of orological nerd nitpicks, this is a really nice watch. I mean, it's not going to be for the small wristed. It's not going to be for folks who are after light and svelte. No one's going to be looking at this and going, hmm, let's see, should I get the little Alpinist or should I go with the, oh my god, Marine Master 300? No, absolutely not. This is a big, beefy diver that is meant for... Well, frankly, big beefy divers, right? Um, so if you are looking at things like the Omega Planet Ocean, if you're looking at the Rolex Deep Sea, if you're looking at one of those other big, chunky dive watches, uh, you're looking for something that's kind of beefy and tooly by design, then by God, 
this is kind of Seiko's answer to that. And relative to those comp competitors, I can see this actually feeling like a very good deal because it's got a high-end movement. It's got a lot of good things going for it, but it is coming in way lower than some of those prices. And it could be a better choice, that is, for, for wrists that are, uh, you know, they're thick and you want to be beefy watch, but it's not the widest wrist ever. This lug-to-lug -lug distance is going to make this a lot more wearable for some people if you really want that big, chunky aesthetic. So, final, final conclusion, although Seiko is still definitely showing some of their budget routes and the choices they made here, and that's an area where they can definitely still improve, this remains a very cool piece. And if you're after that very specific desire, if you're picking up what this guy's putting down and you're willing to pay that price, then, uh, you know, I can see you falling pretty deeply uh, in love with the Marine Master. So anyways, there you go. Hope this has been interesting to you and have yourselves an absolutely wonderful rest of your day. Bye now.